Okay, so three, two, one, clap. Oh, I thought you were doing I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. But, but yes. <laughs> Go for it when you're ready. Uh, okay. Three, two, one. Welcome to Rule of Thirds, an offshoot of our Screen Refresh podcast. Our goal every episode is to take a little break from watching and analyzing movies to dive headfirst into some nostalgia or just get a little creative. So every month we select a different topic and create a top three list that may or may not be near and dear to each of our hearts. Shoot us a message on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Screen Refresh, or send an email to ScreenRefresh at gmail.com to let us know what your top three are or suggest future topics. I'm your host, Tim, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Dean and Nick. Hello there. Hey everybody! Hey how? Today we're Hoo-ah. today we're taking a look at tired tropes that drive us crazy. So settle in for some rule of thirds. You know how to drive Tim crazy right off the bat? Interrupt his intro? No, I uh, didn't hit record. So I hit record and said hello there. So you'll know where my thing starts. <laughs> You can't keep getting away with it! So, yeah, so tired tropes. All of those movie cliches, those show cliches, those, I guess, just generally media cliches. I don't know if you guys are doing, like, books or other things or games and whatnot, but... Oh, I'm totally movies. Maybe I misunderstood. Okay, yeah, I kept it kind of like movies and TV. But I think these things probably cross over into a bit of everything. I'd say so. Which... I think sometimes cliches aren't necessarily a bad thing. Just because it's popular doesn't mean that it's bad. I think sometimes when things are leaned into, it can be a bit fun, as we'll see with some of these uh, items here. I know a lot of people take the tropes and kind of make it a little bit more meta or turn them on their head. So it ends up being uh, a little poking fun of we're also in on the joke kind of deal. But for the most part, it's... It's a bit of a bother sometimes. I like when I'm at a restaurant and I eat everything on my plate and the waitress is like, guess you hated it. (laughs) (laughs) And then you storm out. (laughs) You leave a bad Yelp review and you storm out. Guess you hated it. (laughs) I was trying that new catchphrase that maybe that one doesn't work. I'll stop the t-shirt productions then. (laughs) Now on ScreenRefresh.com, get your Guess You Hated It t-shirts from Dean. (laughs) With my face like looking with eyebrows up and my shoulders shrugging. (laughs) Your suspenders. No, I'd imagine him wearing one of those like retro 50 diner outfits that the uh, waitress would wear. (laughs) Oh yeah, yeah. From that perspective, yeah. (laughs) With the hat, the paper hat on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this scenario. Yeah. Yeah, that makes more sense. (laughs) Yeah. As the guest, you wouldn't be like, guess you hated it. What? That's a little too meta. (laughs) I'm sure the cashiers just love hearing, like, whenever uh, an item doesn't ring up. Oh, does that mean that it's free? (laughs) I was literally (laughs) going to say that. (laughs) They go hand in hand. So those, those are real life tropes. Yeah, so those are real life tropes and cliches and tired phrases. So how about we get into some, uh, some I don't know, like uh, writing faux pas, some of these things? I will lead in the segue into being tired. Whenever there's a combat fight and the guy hits the other person so hard that they just immediately get knocked out. I titled it All Tuckered Out. <laughs> and I think Batman is a perfect kind of explanation for it, especially. I mean, you guys don't know this, but uh, when criminals fight me, it's exhausting because I'm good. So they often have to nap afterwards. Wait, wait, you, you can't be this. You think, you think they're sleeping. Look at that poor little guy. He's all tuckered out. But it's not limited to just that in particular, where he beats the shit out of people and they get knocked out. I'm also talking about when I like certain action movies. Um, what was I just watching? So my wife's watching Supernatural. And there's one episode where I won't digress too much, but just like I saw it yesterday and like perfect example of the whole trope thing. 
So they're in a bank. The two main characters are in a bank that's being held hostage and they're assumed to be the ones holding hostage of everybody in the bank. They send SWAT people in there. One of the main characters gets stopped by two SWAT team members in full riot gear. And he just does, he does, the main character just does two haymakers to knock the guards out. And that's all that was needed. And I'm like, that's, that's not how this works. A single punch to an armored guy isn't going to knock him down. And the same thing with Batman in the opposite extreme, punching him as hard as you do doesn't knock him out. You just killed or hospitalized these people. Wait, what, what, what was that? What? You, you just said you don't kill. Yeah, I know. It's like my one rule. Yeah, Batman, why don't you look at the guy that you... He's asleep. No, wait, what? (laughs) He's not tired. He's dead. (laughs) Especially when seeing characters get thrown into walls and stuff and they get just like barely injured sometimes i just want to see like dude you just went through six walls can you act like more than you just got a sprained shoulder batman doesn't <laughs> kill he thinks that's too easy a punishment for them he wants them to live maimed for the rest of their lives he just... wants to air quote have them live <laughs> suffer in the hospital for six weeks before if the that's what you can call up yeah <laughs> yeah Well, plus, I like, I mean, this goes hand in hand with a lot of times you'll see in like movies and whatnot of somebody just getting like, oh, we have to knock them out so we can get them somewhere. And they knock the person out with like, I don't know, hitting them over the head or something. I don't know if it's correct, but I heard that like being knocked unconscious for an extended period of time begins to cause brain damage. So in these movies where it's like they hit him over the head with a wrench and knock him out and put him in the trunk of a car and then bring him to a second location and then wake him up with like, oh, throwing water on his face. Okay, if he's been unconscious for what, 27 minutes? Due to blunt force trauma. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I'm sorry, Mr. Bond. He's... He's gone. <laughs> I give those Foley artists credit, too, because they always add in those heavy duty like wrench sounds that whenever that wrench does strike somebody, God damn, that thing. It sounds like it really hurts. <laughs> it's not like a light metal like thing. Whenever it hits, it has oh, that yeah. like heft to it. Yeah. Um, Especially, I think, hitting in the back of the head with a heavy blunt object. That's like you're. You're probably going to kill the person. Absolutely. That's not just going to like knock yeah. them out. They're dead. No, he's just, <laughs> he's just all well, talking. Even out. aside from like action, when they play it for laughs. Right. Yeah. They're followed by a quip or a one liner, usually. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, he's never going to be the same again. <laughs> it makes sense if like they're trying to kill you and you're killing them. I guess it's weird to have a jovial, once you're just so used to killing, I guess, just to have a jovial mindset in that moment i i know i personally my adrenaline would not let me make jokes Quit. in those moments but that's just i do that would be me in survival situations but i guess that's not everybody if you're an i do star. get it though because in comparison either you have like you know dean and i you and i get into a fist fight the first punch knocks me out and i'm out like all cold on the floor versus um that fight hallway scene in iron man 2 where you're seeing Black Widow kick the ever-loving shit out of, like, four or five guards as she's going down the hallway, and she's just, as they're coming, she's knocking them out, as they're coming and knocking them out. And then meanwhile, Happy, John Favreau, is at the main entrance, just fighting that one guy that whole time. Can you imagine, <laughs> like, every fight being, like, an eight to ten minute long fight just for one guy? It should. It should be, like, the raid. You just keep, he I just think keeps most, getting back up. Most real fights, unless you do catch somebody on the perfect you know, right in the jaw or just with a perfect hit. Like it's, it's a lot of scrapping, a lot of grabbing, yeah. pushing and like bad punches, like not with no force behind them. You're just kind of swinging at people. Yeah. There's not a lot of like form. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's a, a shuffle at an alley. This isn't the Kumite. I mean, it's usually used for visceral effect in movies when it looks like a real fight. It's usually for like, not shock, but just like, it doesn't glamorize it. It's like, yeah, this is how it would really be. And it's like, this, I can't think of an example, but I know I, I'm sure I've seen fights like that where it's just, it's brutal and not just they're trading punches and nobody's getting cut. It's, it's just a, just gruesome fighting. 
it's cool to see the movies when yeah. they do it well. Which, to an extent, I know the like the Netflix Daredevil show I thought was cool because it's him getting into scraps, but it's actually him getting like tired midway through, him yeah. like limping, him having like broken ribs. It's yeah. not just oh, we just fought for an hour and I'm bright as rain. <laughs> yeah, because I think that's the the exact opposite end of the spectrum of these people getting knocked out for like hours at a time, supposedly, or the ones where it's like they're. I think it was like, uh, what was it, like maybe one of the Mission Impossibles or something where they're having a fight in, in like a bathroom and people are like getting their heads put through like the porcelain sinks and they're getting thrown through doors and things. And they hop right Dead. back up to their feet to keep fighting. It's like, no, you'd be done after that first one. <laughs> or like, oh, they're yeah. fighting with like heavy objects and it's, oh, you hit the other guy with a wrench in the head. And you're going back and forth. It's like, no, you just hit him with like a yeah. 15 pound wrench to the skull. Yeah, that's not one of my tropes, but that kind of segues into just a different part of fighting. Just when people getting hit with a tire iron or something and they're just like, they kind of look like they're, oh, that hurt a little bit. It's like, no, I should probably go to the hospital. Yeah. Or they like get hit by a car and then they hop back up. How are you not dead? I have no idea. Even just. <laughs> I feel like. Adrenaline gets you so far it before depends. the rest of your body I mean, it, is like, yeah, no, you're on, broken. The car one I could see, if unless they're going eight, you know, fifty miles an hour, you're done. I feel like this is a tough one to segue into. Who's number next? number uh, three, I guess. I, I can do. You want to take a, the uh, back cleanup, Dean? Sure. Uh, okay. So my number three tired trope in a lot of movies, shows, media, all of these things, there will always be a scene. Where you have a scientist or a doctor or a tech guy or somebody talking to the group, and it's always like, here's the explanation of what's happening. And somebody in the group is always like, uh, English, please. And then they say the exact same thing, but just like a really dumbed down version of it. And it always gets on my nerves. It, it's always a case of like... I live my life by that. I don't bother with the, ex the long-winded explanation. I'm just like, how do you play Phoenix Wright? It's a lawyer game. Oh, okay. <laughs> Seri How do computers Wait. work magic? Serious question. Did you talk to Laura about any of this? My wife? No. The listener? Because that's literally word for word, pretty much word for word, one of the things she told me that she hates in movies. Could you tell that we've been friends for ages? <laughs> I was like, are you really going here? As you were explaining your trope, I was like, I can't believe it. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yes, like that definitely gets on my nerves too. I remember I used to watch, uh, what was it, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the Marvel show, and there's the two like tech science agents, Fitz and Simmons, and it would always be like a running gag of them explaining something, like all frazzled, and oh, it's the polarity of the whatever, and yada yada, and then there's always the character that's like, uh, layman's terms, and it's like, yeah, we get it, man. You would think you, after working together for how many years, that you guys would just know, like, he dumb, talk slow. <laughs> English, please. In English, please. Excuse me. In English. <laughs> yeah, it's and and it's never like a different line. It's, it's literally like always word for English, word. I just please. Saw your clip. <laughs> yeah. Well, so another kind of instance of this. I love Event Horizon. It's one of my favorite horror movies. But then there's the whole scene with uh, what was it? Sam Neill, Doctor Ware, and he's explaining how exactly all of this works, and it, it's. Oh, it, it's difficult to explain. It's all this kind of math. And they're like, oh, just try us. Right. Well, um, using layman's terms, use a rotating magnetic field to focus a narrow beam of gravitons. These in turn fold space time consistent with veil tensor dynamics until the space time curvature becomes infinitely large and you produce a singularity. Now, the singularity. Layman's terms. Well, fuck layman's terms. Do you speak English? <laughs> <laughs> Which I think that is the part that then leads into Sam Neill just taking like somebody's uh, magazine, folding two pages together and then poking a hole through it. And he's like, this is what happens. And they're like, oh, <laughs> I love how even in Stranger Things, they started doing that literally the same explanation to do the upside down. And over time, they don't even bother with the full explanation. You just see the stupid like paper plate with the pen through it. Yeah. Speaking of uh, Stranger Things season four coming this fall, actually I don't know when. Don't cut that. Don't up. mention that. It's going to date this up. episode. 
people can go back and listen to it and be like, oh, this was back when Stranger Things was around? I'll never listen to this pe- these people again. <laughs> or they're going to be like, wait, this was all the way back when Stranger Things was only at season four? <laughs> I've been Before swindled. Before Netflix formed the Stranger Things channel. All right. It's like Millie Bobby, oh, wow. Bobby Brown's turning 40 next year. I mean, God. <laughs> Season four. They've been keeping David Harbour alive with necromancy for 15 decades. Also, we discovered necromancy. <laughs> 2053. It's going to be a big year. So one of the fun things, like I, we mentioned before, so a lot of times being able to take these tropes because they've become cliches, you can then use that to kind of tweak it to make it more of like a a tongue-in-cheek thing or like a meta kind of like we're in on the joke kind of deal. So I probably one of my three favorite movies of all time, Matinee, um, I think it was like 1993, the Joe Dante movie with John Goodman. So in the movie, they have a movie within the movie called Mant about this guy that gets irradiated and he slowly turns into a giant ant thing. And there's the doctor in it who constantly just takes not even like advanced terms, but just normal stuff. And then he just dumbs that down into layman's terms. So it's like, yes, it's because when he got the x-ray, which as we know is a form of radiation, this is where it ended up happening. And it's just taking that kind of tired trope of the the layman's terms things and just doing it kind of tongue in cheek. <laughs> That's similar that to movie. the trope. Of um, always explaining what an EMP is. Son of a bitch! Shockwave took down the damn chopper. That's EMP, electromagnetic pulse. Nuclear bass sends it out for miles. Everything electronic shuts down, including choppers and radios. Deke, you the man. I'm the man! Like, I think we know what it is. <laughs> they do need to... Yeah, that is explained. We're going to set off an EMP. Yeah. Oh, what's that? It's a blast from a nuclear weapon. EMP? It would account for the MIGs and the satellites. And the blackout. Electromagnetic pulse, a first strike satellite weapon developed by the... Uh... The Americans and Soviets during the Cold War. I read the brief. Discovered after Hiroshima. Set off a nuclear device in the upper atmosphere. Creates a pulse, a radiation surge that destroys everything with an electronic circuit. The idea being to knock out the enemy's communications for he, she, or they could retaliate. So... GoldenEye exists. I feel like they probably did that, I think, in the first um, George Clooney Oceans movie. Because don't they, they, I think they do that uh, EMP bomb of some sort. Now I'm going to have to go back and watch the I remake of they Oceans. They do it in that, do they? What's a pinch? A pinch is a device which creates like a cardiac arrest for any broadband electrical circuitry. Or better yet, a pinch is a bomb. No, but without the bomb. So when a nuclear weapon detonates, it unleashes an electromagnetic pulse which shuts down any power source within its blast radius. Now that tends not to matter in most cases because a nuclear weapon usually destroys everything you might need power for anyway. But see, a pinch creates a similar electromagnetic pulse, but without the fuss of mass destruction and death. So instead of Hiroshima, you'd be getting the 17th century. I thought they did, because that's what they used to pull the power down on everything. I didn't see it. It's fun. Uh, maybe... a. I- a uh, small concentrated EMP. I don't know. Usually it's like taking out city blocks. Well, yeah, I mean, in this, I think, well, so in the remake, it was they were bringing down the power, I think, it, specifically at one casino. I don't know how big a blast it was. In the original, it was they were taking down the power on the entire strip because they were doing, like, I think, seven casinos at once. They toned it down for the remake then. It was just three. They did. <laughs> it, it's I one of the rare instances where they... Simplify it. <laughs> well, I think it's so they can more so have the the plot of George Clooney specifically targeting this one to get back at like his rival who took his wife or something like that. Whereas the original, it was just we're hitting all of it so we can get rich. <laughs> I'm rich AF boys. I'm Frank Sinatra. He was ocean, that, right? I was gonna say that was Frank Sinatra's exact <laughs> line to end the movie. <laughs> I'm rich AF. <laughs> That's all. So, yeah. So the, the whole English please or dumb it down or layman's terms, that one, it it just grinds my gears. Explain like I'm five. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe four. Maybe a dumb four-year-old. <laughs> so, Dean, you're number three. Oh. <sighs> I won't say both. I have like two that are 
Yeah, I guess they're not really related, but it deals with computers and movies. And what does most of the world use? Windows, probably. Well, at least in America. Linux. <laughs> Windows, Unix then system. probably Mac, and then Linux, right? <laughs> probably on the whole. <laughs> Nobody so. uses these interfaces in movies. <laughs> Nobody uses an operating system that's recognizable, generally. I can, I can explain that. Money? Well, yeah. I was going to say it was licensing. <laughs> But yeah, pretty much. Okay, but you can make, you know, when they show, they're like, I want to look this up online. They go to Fugle or Gugant. Yeah, <laughs> and Log it looks into the, the same. Windows account. And it go looks to the same. You can make an interface that looks normal. This really pertains to like, like Fast and the Furious, like not futuristic, yeah, real... but modern. But they're trying to look futuristic. There's just these interfaces that. Looks super advanced and like (laughs) flashy colors and big ass buttons and nobody uses a mouse. They're always typing on the keyboard and they will all the hotkeys to open up all these windows and they're just hacking essentially. Everything is DOS based. (laughs) Yeah. There is no mouse. It's just. (laughs) And there's never. All command prompt. The screens just look like there's, which in reality they are. They're just an animation that's created by the, you know, post department. But it it just looks like it's nothing's ever in sync with what they're doing. They're never like clicking and some and dragging stuff. Maybe sometimes, but it's like just all these wacky windows that don't really mean anything. Their prop department needs to have a person that actually has some kind of programming because their windows and <laughs> UI is fucking atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Are you telling me that Ludacris isn't actually hacking in any of those films? He's not in space either. <laughs> I haven't seen that one yet. It's in the trailer. Uh oh. <laughs> um. Yeah. It's that. And the reason too why you will always see a Mac over a PC in a in a anything hardware is just because they yeah, and especially the screen side, not just like the back, so you could see the Apple logo. It's because they only right. have to pay one person for the OS and the hardware versus in any other thing where you usually have to yeah. pay like and it's usually like sony and then you also have to pay microsoft as well i get that there's licensing stuff but it i i, I am i'm actually fine like if you make giggle your your search search engine giggle instead of google because <laughs> i know what you mean and i know we don't want to pay them money that's fine with me but just Bing. it's it, it's really the hacking no way i'm getting hacked oh porsky no, no, this is major. They've already burned through the NCIS public firewall. Well, isolate the node and dump them on the other side of the router. I'm trying. It's moving too fast. Oh, this is not good. We're using our connection to the AFIS database. Sever it. I can't. It's a point attack. He or she is only going after my machine. It's not possible. This is DOD level 9 encryption. It would take months to get built. Hey. What is that, video game? No, Tony, we're getting hacked. They get in Abby's computer, the entire NCIS network is next. I can't stop him. Do something, McGee. I've, I've never seen code like this. I mean, take take Avengers out of it, because in a world with Tony Stark, like, all bets are off the table, I guess. Like, Minority Report is, makes sense, because it's the future, and he's doing something, you see, and he's doing something drastically different, using his hands and holograms and such, but... When somebody's at a terminal and all these screens are opening and closing and they're just, I mean, there's of course the I'm in trope, but like that's, (laughs) I can just imagine the director leaning over the actor's shoulder and just, I need you to wiggle that mouse a lot more convincingly and just remember why you're here. If your sister's in jail and you're hacking into this terminal so that you can get the exact cell number, I need to see that conviction. So I need you to really wiggle that mouse and clatter them keys. Am I using booleans in this scene? <laughs> so in, in terms of the, the whole payment thing that Nick mentioned, if I was Microsoft or like if, if I was any of the, like, why wouldn't they just say, as long as your heroes use Bing exclusively, you can have it for free? They do. I think that's what happened with Spider-Man. Oh, really? <laughs> Probably. I mean, that's the joke too. Like, um, <laughs> there's that meme of Andrew Garfield, like, yeah, he's supposed to be a super genius kid, but he uses Bing as a search engine. <laughs> I, I mean, well, he's a kid. He's a, looking up porn mostly. IT it's a joke, but <laughs> Bing is not. For those that are not tech savvy, that is not the correct answer. If you were to say, "What is your favorite internet search engine?" Bing is <laughs> should not be on that list. 
just because I hop onto Microsoft Edge and go to my Bing homepage. You can have it to... as your homepage. It just can't be your default search engine. True. What do you so you get on <laughs> you get on Linux, log on to Bing, and then into what was the Google thing that got shut down their social media platform? Google oh, Plus. Google Plus. Google Plus, yeah. <laughs> search on Bing and then get on Google Plus. I have a lot of friends on Google Plus. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Are you close to your account? <laughs> shut down. For misuse. Because it's time to sunset it. <laughs> yeah. So computers. Which are you gonna lead into the the I'm in trope then? No. Do we have any in, in particular? Are we gonna mention the, the Jurassic Park Linux scene? It's Unix system. Oh Unix, sorry. He doesn't know this. Uh I think it was a South Park episode. I don't know if it was the movie, but I forget what they're doing. But all the boys are standing around the computer and Kyle's like hacking quote unquote and he's just like using his pointer fingers to touch keys and he's kind of looking around the room like he's like i'm just i'll just reroute the encryptions and just kind of looks around to see if anybody's like pick <laughs> list paying attention to him <laughs> he's like i'm just saying bullshit <laughs> i'm just saying bullshit essentially is what he's doing <laughs> is anybody else picking up on this what were you going to lead into tim i'm in nothing that was it okay Jurassic park sacred i won't say anything about there their computer hacking scene. Well, in fairness, it's built on a shitty system that they paid the lowest bidder for. I mean, he's it's only true. in a command prompt, and like, it's not like he's like bringing up. He just keeps trying commands, which I I buy. But yeah, but then like at the end of the movie, what is this system that she's using? Where it's like, oh, you oh, know that... how to get to your files? You have to like do this <laughs> visual interface of like flying. <laughs> oh right, right, right. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Where exactly is my download folder? There it is. Can you imagine how maddening that would be to like have to zoom in and out how slow it, it took in the movie to like zoom into the files? <laughs> like, this isn't yeah. it. It's like you're trying to find that porn folder that you bury in deep inside the uh, system files in like a random folder. <laughs> <laughs> and that folder called taxes. <laughs> Tax documents 2012. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, Dean. Did I just blow up your spot? <laughs> Nowadays on the family computer, I just put it under Rush albums. My wife hates <laughs> Rush. Um, oh, XXXY? Yeah, 2012. Um, that, that old Rush album. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, computers. Computers and movies. Very tropey. Just pay Windows, everybody. You don't need a special GUI. Oh, I have one. It was it wasn't even on my list, but it made me think of it when you mentioned computers. Why do computers blow up with fire on impact? <laughs> <laughs> and also as a bonus point, movies like Star Wars or any other kind of um sci-fi or action movie where the controls to a door are immediately adjacent on the door itself shooting said control panel will always open it if it's closed or lock it if it's already opened never like that oh the the classic you go through the door and then you just shoot the panel yeah and it's like good now they can't follow yep but then also everything having to literally explode in a ball of flame if you would take a baseball bat to it oh it's that's, from the overclocking that's that's not that's not how computers work. <laughs> I've made a personal piece of equipment spark once. And let me tell you that um, you only get one spark and it's not more of a much of a spark. It's more of a loud popping noise and then a really bad smell afterward. <laughs> yeah. It's... And then just some Fritz noises. It's pretty much, you know, you fucked up. <laughs> so I don't know what computers in the movie world are filled with. But that does bring us to top of the order. Nick, that, what's your number two? That that Tim, that was my number two. Oh, that was your number two. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was just no. another follow up to Dean's thing <laughs> no. because we were still on computers. No, I'm gonna. I was gonna say, I'll wow, honest, that's really. I thought the same thing. It's elaborate for just an off the cuff. <laughs> what you thought, Dean? You thought it was all right. Then I, I guess I got a gimme. Then <laughs> it actually makes sense because I can't elaborate on that one much more. But it is uh, that's fine. Like I said, so, rule of sevens. There you go. Hopefully so, we built up enough of a rapport with our listeners during this episode to just be like, it's a little unstructured. 
We're just talking this tropes. Is, this this one, yeah, especially. So I hate mystery boxes. What are stories but mystery boxes? There's a fundamental question. In TV, the first act is called the teaser. It's literally the teaser. It's the big question. So you're drawn into it. Then, of course, there's another question, and it goes on and on and on. I mean, look at, like, Star Wars. You've got the droids. They meet the mysterious woman. Who's that? We don't know. Mystery box. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just, I don't care. I'm just pointing them out. J.J. Abrams, you piss me off sometimes, and I'm on to you, and it doesn't work anymore. And any director that feels they should go down that same route. So I understand if you're writing something, especially with a lot of shows, they don't know the ending when they write the beginning and the pilot and you slowly get there over time. And a lot of the greatest stories ever written were not written with the exact ending at that specific time when they were shooting certain things and, you know, it was slowly getting there. But please have the intent of properly finishing it and bridging that gap. Don't just string me along with these mystery boxes without even having a single clue as to what's behind it and i'm looking at you lost with the fucking bunker door and then the computer that has the random code on it and then after that point and the stupid smoke monster thing or so help me god why do you have luke's lightsaber that's a great question for another time <laughs> you'll never go into star wars <laughs> You're going to tease Star Wars like for the, for years. Yes. I love it. It's such a, a massive trope that, and he did so many that it's just, how are, uh, I'm beyond frustrated. Does he do it? Any of yeah. his movies stick out or just his, or just lost? What other shows has, has he done? Um, I don't know Star Anything Trek enough. Alias? I like the Star Trek movie. But I mean, his big problem with Star Trek was his use of lens flare. But I don't really care about that. Yeah, the animal. I didn't even flares, notice. Yeah. Also, the fact that he didn't like Star Trek. I think it was an interview <laughs> with John Stewart or something. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, that the interviewer he was talking about how like he doesn't like Star Trek, and that's how he why he wanted to do it is so he can make it a Star Trek that he liked. And it's like <laughs> so so you wanted to make it more Star Wars. <laughs> You son of a bitch. I like Lost, personally. I completely understand all of the criticisms it gets. But at the end of the day, I still... It was an emotional journey for me. So, I mean, that's this is besides the point. I'm not defending Lost. Which one? I Star Wars it. or Star Trek? Lost. Neither. Lost. Oh, lost. I as, trailed as off. As I him. totally yeah. get all the criticism of that, of that show, but I was there for the emotional journey and... It worked. I mean, it hooks you. He he does a good yeah. job of hooking you, but it's just <laughs> shame on me. Fool me once, you know. Shame on you. <laughs> like, no, I don't. I'm not doing this anymore. And it's having him been around, knowing that's his trope, really kind of gets under my skin nowadays. Because now I'm just waiting for it, and he's done it a couple of times in The Force Awakens, and it's just um, the Rise of Skywalker is completely filled with those types of tropes that I'm not going to get myself started. But he starts something and he never finishes it. It's the Wait, mystery give me, is more important than the answer. Give me one. I could just give me one. All right. Rise of Skywalker. Um, you've seen it. Yes. That's the third one. Yes. Yeah. They're all about to die in the quicksand. So Finn is like, Ray, Ray, I have something to tell you. Never brought up again. <laughs> you're on your deathbed and you're about to tell someone <laughs> A deep, dark secret of yours. And then when he's directly called out on it, the literally the next scene, he's like, I I forgot. Use your <laughs> powers. Say. Clear my history. I don't remember that, but that's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> and that was Ray. the only problem that Nick had with Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> with that Ray, scene. I have something to tell you. <laughs> it's about my it's about my character development. I Ray, want to be in this movie I have to more. ask you about the warranty on your... Uh... <laughs> the creators of South Park have a class that they, they give sometimes in regards to storytelling. And I really should watch it more recently so I can have the notes like readily available in my head. But he, they explain on how you know the proper way of good storytelling is always to make sure that something happens to the characters as a result of their decisions. Never just, and then this happened. And that's all what happens to be um abrams's style is just and then this happened and then this happened and it's not never because of what the characters had done specifically to alter their own story it's just and then out of nowhere something 
this causes them to change their decision. Um, whereas like <laughs> yeah. the South Park guys were insisting that, you know, it's just, you know, Tim, you're thirsty. So you want to make a lemonade stand, but because you made the lemonade stand a bun, like the local gang took notice Everyone and then dies. that causes you to start your adventure instead of just one day, the neighbors decided to come over and raid your house. It doesn't have that proper, um, call to action sort of thing. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Take note, Abrams. <laughs> Sometimes it honestly amazes me when I watch some shows that I I could really respect the writing because there's going to be a storyline that sets up something. I'm like, okay, and then it leads into something else. And then that the result of it leads into something else. And then I'm like, I never would have thought to set up all those pieces in the beginning of the episode to lead it into eventually the actual plot of that episode. I mean, I get it too. Every some when you create something like this, it's literally from nothing. But it's just sometimes the journey is better than the. That's what rewrites are for. Yeah, you get it all out, and it's shit, and then you gotta go f- refigure it out, baby. Better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Write it, print it, out the door. <laughs> On to the next. <laughs> yeah, in the case of Lost, the journey is better than a destination, but at least have yeah, a destination sure. in mind. Yeah, they wrote. They couldn't write themselves out of it, but I was like, I, I like was it super involved in it. I picked it up after it had started. So a friend of mine in high school let me borrow like the first season DVDs, and I literally just sat in my room for like the entire day, banging it out. And then for some reason, once they hit the, I forget how far into the series it is, when they're like, oh, we have to go back, and the whole going back to the island deal, and that's when for like lack. Of, for lack of a better word, that's when they lost me. Like it's at that point, it was I don't care what the result of this mystery is. After three Damn, seasons, I skipped. It's a to great the end. season. It was the beginning of three. So. That was the third seat. That was the opening of season three. Wait, where was it? Yeah. Oh my god, I didn't last that long, man. Yeah, I got about <laughs> one and a half. They opened the door. I to loved the bunker. it all. They started typing in the number into the computer, and then they fucked up once and realized nothing bad happened. And that's when I'm like, I'm done with this. I don't want to deal with this anymore. And then they just brute force it. <laughs> they wrote a. They could have just wrote a program. It's a unit system. I know this. We have one There's of those only sixteen uh, quintillion options here. What are those? One of those birds that Homer Simpson tries to use in one of those episodes to <laughs> keep <laughs> pushing <laughs> the same key. <laughs> yeah, the bird. What are those birds yeah. for anyway? Are they just like a, a just a trinket that like go in the water or something. I think they during World forward War II, and like they were used water. as an exotic torture device. <laughs> they would Into put the it eyeballs. just above your head, and it would just keep hitting you in the forehead <laughs> until eventually your skull cracks. Wow, that's medieval shit. I'm gonna get medieval on your ass. <laughs> Some medieval shit. No research was done in the making of this episode. So, <laughs> I guess, so my number two, as you know, is my number two. So I hate in movies when they do the, <laughs> the as you. <laughs> it makes me feel good seeing an actual belly laugh from Nick on something. So it drives me crazy in movies and shows when people give information to characters that should already be aware of the information that it's just obviously being done for the viewer. Look, you're supposed to be winning the hearts and the minds of the natives. Isn't that the whole point of your little puppet show? You look like them and you talk like them and they'll start trusting us. We build them a school, we teach them English, but after what, how many years? Relations with the indigenous are only getting worse. Yeah, that tends to happen when you use machine guns on them. Right. Come here. This is why we're here, unobtainium, because this little gray rock sells for 20 million a kilo. That's the only reason. It's what pays for the whole party. It's what pays for your science. Comprendo? Now those savages are threatening our whole operation. We're on the brink of war, and you're supposed to be finding a diplomatic solution. So use what you've got and get me some results. Like, it's, it's insulting to me. I mean, this goes in the the same line of being like all these things of, um, I don't, I think actually the, the joke is, I feel like every single one of my biggest pet peeves is, takes place in the, the Netflix movie fear street that I watched like a couple months ago. (laughs) It's like the, the biggest perpetrator of all these things that annoy me. 
But it's like the whole little brother. Yeah, big sister. Well, you remember what mom said on her deathbed. I said I would promise to always watch over you, especially because of dad's drinking. Yeah, you've been around 17 years. You already know this. Like, your sibling isn't, like, clueless to this. They know. (laughs) It's like every episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! And they throw a card out and they're like, as you know, the blue eyes white dragon with its 3,000 attack points. It's like, yeah, Kaiba's fought you a thousand (laughs) times. He knows what it does. In fairness, though, I love it because it's just so over the top. Next I play Pot of Green. This allows me to take two cards from my deck and add them to my hand. It's (laughs) It's <laughs> but that's like it, that that's tongue in cheek at that point true. where it's ironic that we're watching it and enjoying it for that reason. But in any other movie, yeah, it's I, I don't why are you telling the the fossil hunter Alan Grant how a T Rex is a carnivore? I think he kinda knows this shit already. Grant, as you know, our T Rex is a meat eater. Like no shit. What if you're like, what? You don't say. <laughs> My research. My prime example of this, which I've touched on already because we covered this movie, but in Mortal Kombat 1995, <laughs> Shang Tsung, this is my this is my number two, so you're taking my trope here, so we're just combining here. <laughs> um, Shang Tsung's talking to Goro, and he's like, I've come to warn you of another danger, Princess Kitana, and Goro is like, the Emperor's adopted daughter? Her? Why should we worry about her? It's like she's 10,000 years old and the rightful heir to the throne of Outworld. Princess Kitana. The Emperor's adopted daughter? Why should I worry about her? Princess Kitana is 10,000 years old and the rightful heir to the throne of Outworld. Yeah, she's 10,000 years old. Goro's 500 years old. They, they, they've probably heard this story by now. <laughs> It just it's it's more so Goro's like the Emperor's adopted daughter? Is that the Princess Katana we're talking about? Just once I want like Shang to just like look to him and just give like an eyebrow. Just like a Yeah. Yeah, Ice, you got it. Uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um obviously She's a thousand years old, the rightful heir. Who? <laughs> Goro. <laughs> Goro, go punch now. (laughs) My head's fuzzy from all these fights. (laughs) 500 years is a lot of time for concussions. Just in between fights, Shang Tsung, just flashcards. Have you seen the Will Smith movie? (laughs) It's kind of like that. (laughs) Neither did I. Yeah, but I it's just yeah, to your point. You you both know this information. You both know the other person knows this information. It's just find a find a better way to weave it in. And I always point it back to Toy Story. It's like a fucking masterclass in getting exp- exposition across without <laughs> being a trope. That's actually what was on the DVD cover. <laughs> Toy Story. <laughs> that, that was a masterclass. <laughs> <laughs> Roger Ebert. Roger and Ebert says. <laughs> Roger and Ebert? <laughs> Roger Ebert. <laughs> Which one am yeah. I thinking of? Oh, Siskel and I Ebert. Thought... <laughs> he said and... Roger and Ebert. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know that Roger and Ebert at one point used the Patara air rings to fuse into <laughs> Roger Ebert? Wait, the ten rings? Yeah, it... And then this happens. A lot of there's too many examples also, to, to name this to do that, but well, it happens then all the time. Other ones try to be clever and they start explaining something, and then the other person will be like, Yeah, I know this information already. And it's like, just because you do that, write it into your script of, Yeah, and then this person's <laughs> going to act annoyed and be like, I already know. You don't have to tell me after they already finished explaining all the <laughs> exposition. Doesn't make you clever. I read the brief. We have to go to the temple and get the amulet. Yeah, I know. And then we have to get the princess so she can activate the amulet. I know this already. It's an extension of um, show, don't tell. I yeah, was going to sure. bring that up as one of my tropes, but I mean, it, it does go hand in hand considering it's just, there are better ways of explaining <laughs> exposition on film. And yeah, That's, sometimes yeah. you can just say it, but it's a lot better to just actually show and let the person infer as to what's going on. You don't have to make it some deep dive 
confusion fest like the ending to matrix 2 and everyone's just stare sitting there like what the hell is going on who's this architect guy and what is he talking about you don't have to do it that <laughs> way irrevocably <laughs> Ergo, vis a vis, <laughs> concordantly. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that's that's a great skit that's like lost to time because it was fucking part of the MTV Movie Awards. But that so that's everybody the out there, go on Bing. parodies of all time. Um, Look for the Will Ferrell Matrix Two uh, MTV Movie Awards opening. Oh shit! I had a. I was gonna say something. Oh, I forget it. I lost it. Damn, Will Ferrell, you screwed me up. <laughs> I always just think of the the one with Sarah Michelle Gellar and Jack Black, the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I thought you were bringing up an example. I was like, what the hell no. is this? No, whenever yeah. I think of like the movie parody from MTV Movie Awards, I always think of that. I think I've seen that, but I really don't recall what it's about. It's raunchy. <laughs> yeah, I it's can Jack imagine Black so with like Jack Black involved. Yeah. <laughs> he gets the ring. We need to take so, the writers of the MTV Movie Award parodies and get them to just do a skit show. Just movie parodies in five minutes. I'd watch that. And just have it as commercial breaks? It's the best thing MTV ever did, other than music videos. <laughs> that was short-lived. <laughs> I'm surprised they still make music videos. Like, who the hell watches them? You gotta go out of your way to watch it now. It's not like it's just let me turn the that's TV young, on to that channel. Yeah, it's a young person's game. I don't know if it's a young person's game. It's a who the hell's game is this? Got me. They're on yeah, YouTube, I, feel I guess. Like nowadays, but... the only reason they make music videos is so up and coming directors have a way to break into the whole <laughs> thing. I feel like you it's always an apprentice see... program. Yeah, it's like oh, he now directed this Oscar winning film. He got his start doing music videos for Ching Madonna. Or... Madonna or like all these random things. You mean in 2016? Yes. The golden <laughs> era of music videos, 2016. <laughs> hey, I remember back in the day when it used to be like, uh, what was it, in high school, they did like the week-long countdown leading up to the release of the new Fall Out Boy music video on a Friday oh, yeah. night. And it's like, everybody's excited. <laughs> oh, yeah. And now to think about like, yeah, oh, what are you doing on Friday? Yeah, the new music video is coming out. It's going to be five <laughs> minutes of fun. <laughs> But I mean, I so sidebar, I remember back in the day before we had like the Pandora or like the start of all the the major streaming options back in like middle school. And (laughs) we had what was it like Yahoo music videos or something like that. It was just like this music video browser thing. But you couldn't choose what you watch, so it was just kind of like a genre of music. And then it would just play all of these music videos at random. So that was the only way I can listen to a lot of these songs at the time, was just randomly going through watching the music videos. I was so. there, Gandalf. I was there <laughs> 3,000 years ago. Well, Nick, as you know, Yahoo music videos. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's it'll always have a soft spot in my heart because I'll remember all of these random music videos specifically because of that. And then I found uh, Winamax and LimeWire and Kaza and... We were off to the races. <laughs> Here comes the RIAA <laughs> and Lars Ulrich. Um, <laughs> Leading them like the riders of Rohan. <laughs> Death! <laughs> off tempo, but still leading them. You hear that, Lars? <laughs> he can He's not even the best drummer in Metallica. You're not from the Netherlands. Yeah, so my that was my number two was the forced exposition through uh, a dialogue. So, so I'm I'm sorry, ya. Dean. Do you want to have another see number two, later. or do you want to just? I could pull from my over. wife's examples. Go for it. Sure. You took one of those. Oh wait, but then if I if I take from her example and it's one of yours, which it very well might be, I don't want to do that. I'll take one um, that I don't think anybody's going to say. Sidebar, um, we're all, we're only about 50 minutes in and we're usually about 90 and we're almost done. So It's totally okay, can, guys. We can pass oh, for yeah, time. Man. And 20 minutes of this was off topic. <laughs> 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 That's why I said for the listeners before this episode, I was like, this is going to go fast. We need, we're going to talk about all the tropes. Love them. Um, my wife used to smoke. She smoked for years. And Nick, you used to smoke and you'd vape. I know where this is going. Yeah. Um, Maybe. (laughs) She 
hates when somebody unprompted they 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 get out a cigarette they light it up they like puff it like twice and then they just flick it away she's like oh never my in god a million years that never i in think a million years would a smoker just i think a that is like- <laughs> that is the reason why i hate the movie the strangers that is the exact really? just waste reason of cigarettes so the whole point of the story is is you know the wife and the husband are having like a tough time and she, Liv Tyler decides to smoke a cigarette. It's her last one, and she just fucking throws it out. And then the boyfriend decides to go out and, like, get her another pack. And that's when the strangers show up. But just the way that she wasted that last cigarette, knowing this is your last one as a smoker at that time, I called bullshit instantly. <laughs> I always thought in movies it was a show of power to show people that I can waste a cigarette. That's a $12 pack. No, that's owning pets. <laughs> what you don't see is when they they walk away like at a power move, but then as soon as they get out of eye shot, they light up another one quickly. <laughs> <laughs> no, as soon as the camera moves, they run back and pick it off the ground. <laughs> as a as a smoker, I'd always bothered me a bit seeing um, actors that don't smoke, and you can usually tell the difference between the real smokers and the ones that are literally acting because of the way that they inhale and exhale the smoke out. Because at least when you're eating, you have the spit bucket, so you don't have to show that, you know, you're swallowing. You can just do that between takes. But you can't really do that with lit cigarettes. You have to show yourself doing the whole exhaling motion. But depending on the volume of the smoke, you can tell whether or not they're doing it for real or if they're just acting. And I always pick up on Mm. that because you can tell that they're never really, I don't know. It's like as as an ex-cigarette smoker... They're expensive. If I'm going to smoke it, I'm going to smoke the damn thing. And then watching them do it on TV show and movies, it's like they do it out of like novelty. <laughs> it's not a good novelty habit. I don't even want to see it if you're not going to take it seriously. Now it's even taboo to just see it in general. Right. Yeah, it's funny to bring this up because you don't really see much smoking anymore. But it's not, I wonder if they just... Because it's not always uh, embedded in the character's identity. It's just like, you know, lots of people smoke, so this guy smokes. And maybe it's just they used it as a, you know, some actors like to use an object or like t- having activity while while in a scene like just helps them get into it more. And like, I'm sure smoking so they know what has to do just with been that activities one or two times. What? It's so they know what to do with their hands. <laughs> yeah, so it's not coming up to their face. <laughs> So their hands are not all over the place. <laughs> well, also, I think it's just like cinema shorthand for like prior to like 1990. It was, oh, they're cool. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, they're nervous. <laughs> yeah. That's why if we ever make a screen refresh movie, we're going to not have a spit bucket. All the actors will eat entire meals every take and everybody's going to smoke down to the filters. As long as we hire Brad Pitt, I think we're good. <laughs> every, I think Robert Downey Jr. eats too, right? And Chris Pratt. That's that's awesome. We're two thirds Marvel already. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think regardless of what our system is, if we have the two of them, I think we'll be fine anyway. <laughs> we'll find the fun. True. <laughs> What's our movie? You're just gonna smoke and or uh, and eat entire meals. It's gonna be our uh, screen refresh remake of my dinner with Andre. <laughs> you know that scene in the Reservoir Dogs? What if that was the whole movie? That's our movie. <laughs> <laughs> not the not the ear cutting scene. The scene in yeah, the car. So. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's just ninety minutes straight of them trying to drive to the hospital. I'm fucking dying. You ain't gonna die. <laughs> the sad part is, even though I've seen Reservoir Dogs, the first thing that comes to mind for me is the Frisky Dingo episode where they're doing the parody of it. Yeah, <laughs> with like uh, what's his name, Taquil as the clown or whatever it is in the front seat. Yep. <laughs> Save the I gotta go words. back and watch this show. You gotta take me to the hospital. You know I can't do that, Jimmy. I'm dying, bro. You ain't gonna die. die. Say it. I'm all shot up, man. You ain't gonna die. Say the freaking word. I ain't gonna die. I ain't gonna die. I ain't gonna. That was my uh, pinch hitter trope. Smoking. It's a good your, one. Your sidebar. Your proxy list. My proxy so list. So Nick. Somehow, under 60 minutes, what's your number one? I have several. Do you want option one or option <laughs> two? Let's pat this time. All right. So I can go back um, to computers too after this. So. Honorable mention number one uh, <laughs> stealthy helicopters. 
<laughs> I hate hey, it. What do you mean about three ninjas? <laughs> Any vehicle in general that just kind of pops in on you out of nowhere. Helicopters, you hear fucking miles away. There is no stealth option that is completely silent. You hear those fuckers coming from like the next state before you even know they're coming in your direction. So for them to just pop up randomly in movies and stuff, I always kind of had to laugh because uh, how did you not know this was coming? Yeah. Um, I was going to say in Silver Bullet too, when the Reverend creeps up in his car <laughs> I did the baseball game. He's just well. In his defense, it's a Prius. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Clearly, I've the traveled. stealthiest of all sedans. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't even take out a kid on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess that yeah. If it's not alien technology, you're gonna hear it. I mean, Prius. You could make an argument for a Prius. <laughs> Those have scared well, me once or twice. I just say the Prius because I think of the what was Tesla, it, the Office one. episode. Um, where they all look out the window and the person's like going to hit the other one with the car and the guy doesn't notice it. And they're like, well, he is driving a Prius. <laughs> <laughs> There's Andy. He's in his car. You guys, what is he doing? Why isn't Dwight turning around? The Prius is silent if he keeps it under five miles per hour. He deserves the win. Uh. Do Teslas kind of make like an alien flying saucer sound, don't they? It's kind of like a modulation, really low. I... I don't know. I can't afford one. You haven't heard the, um, one though. Like you've never had one. I guess out in California, it's probably a lot more prevalent. The um, tire sound on the ground as it's you know, that actually has a noise, and that's usually what you would hear outside it. Right. Right. But, but I don't know that's about how, the actual how freshly that road is paved. I mean, I refuse to believe they're completely silent. I feel there has to be some kind of noise going on, be it a fan or something. Just emanating from the sure wherever the hell the engine is yeah but yeah it, you're right though you hear the um you hear the tire traction on the road before yeah. you hear any mechanics or anything i heard the tesla has to pump in an artificial audio into the cabin just so the driver doesn't go crazy not hearing any kind of engine noise it's like a yeah i think that's thing. how you know at a certain weird. point racing the they'll when race cars are <laughs> just, all electric, they'll like add the sound of the motor to it. <laughs> like you want to experience a Tesla race, just watch Fast and the Furious, but during the race scenes, put it on mute. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, any listeners, s- go and take one of the races in Fast and the Furious. Take out just the the audio of the cars themselves, but keep in all of the <laughs> the, the stick talking, shifting. And the screaming, and the people. Slamming the foot on the accelerator, but you don't hear the engine in response. It's just. I would love that. <laughs> so, Nick, that was your honorable mention. Mm-hmm. Do you have one? Um, or do you have another oh, one? I did. Oh, oh, God. Now it's going to drive me crazy. Like no one else. Dean. Do you have any? No, well, my the, my last one is kind of a two-parter, but it goes on the same thing, so I can't really say that it's a... I have, I have to keep them together, I guess. Depends on how much time Tim needs. <laughs> it's going to drive me crazy. I'm patting for your time. Because when I was giving my number two, it hit my head, and I was like, oh, you know what? I'll do this as an honorable mention. I don't need to write it down, though. I'll remember it. You're getting old, man. I have one more, but I, I'm slightly afraid that it's one of your guys and I don't want to say it. What is it? So I'll say it relates to the activity that they do in Fast and the Furious movies. Broadly. Um, that is not involved with my number one, then. Okay. Um, t- they actually like Corona. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a beer drinker no. by any means, but I always thought that was a shit beer. Hey, I don't mind a Corona with lime. It's tasty. It's nice like yeah. beer. I'm I'm into it. I like a Dos Equis a lot as well. I guess a lager. It's not really light, but I mean, if I'm going to drink a light beer, I'm probably going to go with a Michelob Ultra. None of these endorse us, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we also don't condone drinking at all. Yeah, smoking. We're not in um, a pocket of big, big bear or <laughs> whatever. Bear. That's a town big out bear. here. The big blue house. Some have called me a big bear. Um. <laughs> so your wife. <laughs> I hope it was because if not <laughs> so 
I don't know about you guys, but I have to. I mean, can can you talk to somebody and not look at them while you're driving? It's, I mean, that's how oh, I talk to anybody oh, in the car. Oh, oh, oh. that is, I'm. I didn't write this one down, and I think it's a big one. That's <laughs> my biggest one because I, I, we were talking about that the other day, watching whatever was on TV. I fucking hate seeing that. <laughs> Because I think it was like, what, it's, Silver Bullet where we pointed out that the father was actually watching the road and looking yeah. around and was like, because I think that was like, yes, dear, whatever, damned, dear. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> what kicked off the idea of we need to do an episode of tropes because that one's a big pet peeve. Yeah, and it's it's true. It's 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 it creates anxiety. Like I'm more distracted by like, I'm not paying attention to what you're talking about. I'm like, you're going to crash. And it's kind yeah. of a, a toss up. Like sometimes they'll, that'll happen, and then they'll throw in a surprise where they do crash because they're not looking at the road. But if that's not the intention, it's like it's very distracting. Like when somebody's constantly looking and for set, you know, three, four seconds at a time, looking to the right and not the road. Like what are you doing? Yeah, where when they turn around to talk to somebody in the back seat, and it's like, what? <laughs> Between video games and just general horror movies, I don't ever fall victim to jump scares but whenever i see someone not paying attention i really can never tell the difference if that's just poor writing and the actor's (laughs) going to constantly look away from the road or if an actual (laughs) collision is about to happen and it's just their way of telegraphing it then it drives me crazy when you end up having the movies where they do it but then they do it where like the person is all to the the left of the frame and then they have a lot of wide space looking out their window or something and it's setting it up of, yeah, we know what's coming up next. We're about to see a car coming from that direction. Adaptation has a really good one too. The uh, Nick Cage movie. Charlie Kaufman movie. That's a good movie. It's a great like surprise car crash in that movie. Um, Shit, what was, what was my thing? Oh, driving. You hate driving in movies. I got distracted by my own quick little tangent. Right turns. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say dumb and dumber like they use it to show how dumb Jim Carrey's character is, but I think they also do it as kind of laughing at the trope when he's driving Mary to the airport at the beginning and he he just full on turns around and like starts talking to her and you hear like trucks blurring their horns outside and you hear a like a horrific Massive collision explosion. and it cuts back to her and in the rear view in the out the back windshield you see like a fireball going off yeah. and he just keeps driving like he turns around like nothing happened yeah lots of little you gotta yeah, get that <laughs> example in there have you seen that team <laughs> no no i think i should probably sit down and watch bob and bob and star go to vista del ma they're not from boston but it's fun to say it that way i want to see a gender bent remake with matt damon and ben affleck then with a boston accent <laughs> <laughs> so Bob, Bob and John <laughs> go to St. John. I don't know what doesn't work. John twice. Anyway. So Buttons. I lost track. What number were we on? Does it matter anymore? No, that was I not even my top. My that pocket. was we were trying to stall because you were trying to think of an honorable mention. I, I don't yeah. think it's coming back. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to do like Nick, an Nick still has to technically do his top one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Should I keep going with honorable mentions or going with the top one? <laughs> yeah. Why not? Um, I'm actually running out because I don't like the... Uh... <laughs> Did you know there's no headrests in car seats? This isn't it, but I wrote it down and I'm thinking about it like this really isn't uh, one of them. Yeah, this... It's more of like a filming trope. That came up... I- I've heard of that, but I don't remember the reasoning. I think it's because this way they can actually film the faces and whatnot of all the actors. Yeah, so every time they look turn in the back to look, seat. you can see their head. Yeah. Look in the back seat. No, the yeah. front seats. Well, I, so, the front seats don't have the headrest in the back as they're driving so yeah. that the, per, the, the cameraman in the back seat can easily see the actor's face without the obstruction right. of if, the headrest. Yeah, if that's how they have to film it. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yes. But it's that's just what I meant, like the perspective little... from the back seat, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I've heard of that. It's, yeah, it's more of a, a, a technique. I'm going to do my number one unless you have uh, anything to add, Dean Dino. So my number Dino. one is Breakfast Gotta Run, where the parents <laughs> will have this massive spread of waffles and fruit <laughs> and pancakes and cereal and 
every type of muffin, croissants, you name it. The kid comes downstairs, grabs a fucking like sip of orange juice, the and then runs out the door. And then afterward, they just clean up and throw out all the food. I mean, like we assume. We assume. Yeah. Because no one eats it. It's just that's it. They'll either have like a bite of cereal, a single pop tart, or something that doesn't require all of the hours of labor involved cooking and cleaning afterward. <laughs> Mom, why are you so tired? Well, it took me until midnight to clean up from breakfast. And then I got up at four o'clock to start cooking breakfast again. <laughs> There's an episode. I would love to see once they all sit down and actually just eat the entire meal. They should. It's like a full it. table spread. Mom, please, I'm two hours late for school. <laughs> Have this sixth stack of pancakes. <laughs> so I yeah, I good. agree with that completely. It's bonkers. I don't know if I've seen it more. Well, actually, no, I probably have seen it more recently. I think a lot of these, I just, my brain <laughs> erases them from my head or it just like, I don't see them. That's with all the tropes. Because they're so common. Yeah. A lot of them, I'm having a hard time trying to think of examples, but you see them quite often. And that's why I started, I started with stealthy helicopters. Because I think we talked about it in Silver Bullet. And then when we did Three Ninjas, that's when I'm like, oh, this is a good trope. I'm going to write this one down so I remember. And then as they come up, I continuously just kept writing them in. Because we had a lot of time between the first inception of the trope versus when it would come along. And this one came up when I was watching Breaking Bad. Walter got into a fight with Skyler and just decided to he was going to make breakfast to kind of suck up to everybody. And that's exactly what happened. His son comes in. Walter had made a ton of waffles and pancakes and he had this huge spread. The kid doesn't even eat. And as he's setting the table, his son leaves and then he just picks up that same plate and just dumps everything. But they don't throw out the food as if like, oh, my son didn't even eat. It's just actors doing something to move the scene along and i always thought it kind of stood out when you actually break it down like hey you're you're throwing out like 30 dollars worth of food right now no one no one is eating it <laughs> yeah side note didn't he his son and waffles become like a meme when that yeah, show was airing <laughs> all of his major scenes happened during breakfast so <laughs> So I just so remember like, family, like, like Jesse, Reddit we need to about... cook breakfast. <laughs> so we've established then that they have to smoke down to the filters and they have to eat an entire full <laughs> European uh, breakfast spread. American spread. American breakfast spread. Yeah. Right. 4,000 pancakes. We'll never have sequels because our actors will not live long enough to do the sequels. <laughs> insurance premiums are going to be crazy their heart gave out before they could get to the sequel <laughs> between the heart or the lungs um, <laughs> my smoking impacts the heart too kids that's don't why smoke. you don't pay up front you just say we'll give them 50 percent of the total taken profits and royalties <laughs> <laughs> the arnold schwarzenegger twins way <laughs> wait um, is that what is that how that's how he made twins? his he made his money on twins really that movie was like a, a hit and he took, you know, not scale, but he was like, all right, like I want percentages, like I'll take this low salary. And that movie was a hit and he made, he went, made, it was gangbusters on that movie. It's not like he got rich, quote unquote, I guess. I mean, I think also at the time, Arnold Schwarzenegger, anything would have done gangbusters. Yeah. This was at the point of his career where he wasn't even doing action movies anymore. He was just doing comedies. Because I think that was, it became the novelty of he's done enough action, has established himself as this action star that now people just want to go see comedies because it's like, oh, it's fun. Part of the story was the studio was like, this is not like, we're not going to fund this. And then he took the major cut. I don't know if he got paid much at all, maybe. And then it was just like, give me everything in the back end. And it's like, Studio got screwed on that one. Good job, Arnold. I mean, if I had the option, I think I would always take the percentage. Just because, I mean, it's it's passive income. <laughs> I guess, well, if it's if it's Marvel, like, they're like, no way. Because that's, the, the back end is going to make so much money. Isn't yeah. that what but, um, um, Robert Downey Jr. did, though? 
he has a percentage of the movies? I don't know. They just I and mean, they he gets paid a shitload up front. I don't know how much he works into the back end, but I feel bad for usually his, that's um, the trade off. But obviously, I have Scar no Joe. experience. She got fucked out of agent. that deal. She has every right to sue. I'm on Scar. Go to hell, Disney. That's some real scummy shit that they try to pull. <laughs> so I'm laughing at Tim's face when I say "Go to hell, Disney." <laughs> the mouse hairs all. Especially after I made the the two sound clip jokes of Mickey Mouse throwing us in prison for using uh, Disney oh, yeah. clips. <laughs> yeah. That was good. It's a radar yes. I don't want to be that on. That was funny. See y'all real soon. <laughs> <laughs> the South so, Park episodes with with Mickey Mouse were always funny because they played him out to be the mob boss that he secretly is. <laughs> <laughs> so was that your actual number one, Nick? Breakfast. Breakfast was, yeah. Yep. Which I guess brings me to my number one that annoys me greatly in a lot of films and shows. The whole, uh, when the hero finally gets the villain and they fight him to a draw or whatever, and then gets the upper hand, and it's somebody is always, don't, if you kill him, he wins, or if you kill him, you're no better than he is. Mm, Come on, man. Like, this guy, like, blows up a bus full of puppies or something like that, and you fight your way to him, he kills your family, and then you get him, and it's like, if you kill him, he wins. No, but I I don't think he wins. (laughs) I think he might lose that. He might take the L on that one. The ultimate loss. <laughs> yeah. I am under the impression that the death penalty is, uh, there's certain, there's a certain point in human behavior where you go too far and no matter how long you're stuck life imprisonment, that's just not the proper way to sentence somebody. And I think, uh, I understand that maybe the judge should not also be the executioner, but yeah. so you hate Judge Dredd. He um, is the law. <laughs> I um, am the law. Um, I well, when it comes to the, why well, you got to make it hard, Nick? Yeah, I was, I mean, say, I was comes, talking movies, and now we're into death penalty. <laughs> I mean, it still goes, you know, it's hand heavy. in hand. But at the very least, with like the supervillains and shit. Yeah, I mean, Joker just decided to uh, yeah. wipe out the whole city with the fucking like Smilex makeups and stuff. And he's killing people left and right, leaving the city in a panic, you know, um, trying to think of other massive, like villains that just deserve death, not jail I think time it's, instead. It's tricky because it comes down to like a heat of the moment thing. And like Joker's hanging upside down defenseless and like, okay, he's, he can't do anything anymore. Are you still rage killing him? Or is it like, He's he actively didn't. shooting at you, swinging at you, but you're trying to defend yourself, and then you just you go for a kill shot. Like it's kind of like I understand the self defense part of killing in that situation, but if somebody's like no longer a threat, it's like I was thinking more along the lines of Jack Nicholson's Joker, not Heath Ledger's. I mean, they're both hanging there by a string there at the end. Um, yep, but one one definitely fell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's. Yeah, it's this ongoing thing, or especially in maybe not a movie, but a series where scenes that goes on a longer timeline or like some like anime shows or things like that of if you kill him, you're no better than he is. And they'll let the villain live. And then two episodes from then or like three issues of a comic from then that villain. No, he murdered everybody in the prison and broke out. And now he (laughs) killed another bus full of puppies. And it's like, oh, I'll get you this time. He can't keep getting away with this. He can't keep getting away with this. Like it's, it's that ridiculous cyclical nature of, yes, I feel like real life is a very different scenario, but in my media and in my fiction, it's, I I don't think we've, yeah. (laughs) I want him dead. I want his family dead. I want his house burnt to the ground. I want to go to the middle of the night. I want to piss on his ashes. No, so it's it's very different as far as, like you said, Joker, of this guy, every weekend he spends it like melting people's faces with acid and all these things, and it's just, <laughs> oh. But maybe if he's in Arkham long enough, he'll rehabilitate. 
No, I don't think he's ever getting a, like a normal <laughs> job, like a nine to five. If you're good at something, never do it for free. So which of you fine gentlemen would like to join our team? Working nine to five. <laughs> I don't I think he's like point. packing a brown bag lunch and he's going to be like, oh, guess I'm normal now. I did like Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns that at least he finally killed him at that point. But I do feel it was probably 20 years too late. Yeah. Well, then this kind of goes into a, another trope that annoys me usually is whenever we do have a, a story or when we do have something that does explore the idea of, well, what if the hero does finally go that extra step and kill this villain that's been like terrorizing everybody for ages, like Injustice, the comic series from DC, where Superman snaps and he kills Joker, or uh, I think it was, was it Mark Wade's Irredeemable, where the plutonian like snaps and kills a villain or something it always ends up being this entire storyline that's the same of well yep once they killed that one they decided killing's fun and then they just go crazy and turn things into like a <laughs> fascist nazi police state and it's like so i, I don't think that necessarily kidding? means that's the direct result all the time <laughs> It's not like, oh, Joker killed Superman's family. Superman killed him and then decided, wait a second, I can become the king of the world. It's like, no, <laughs> I don't think that necessarily leads directly in. Mom always told me murder leads to genocide. <laughs> and um, once upon a time, that was one of the things I hated about it because one of the good characters, Snow White, gets corrupted. I don't remember the storyline. It's toward the end. But she gets corrupted for whatever reason. And she goes from goody two-shoes to, like, I'm going to kill a puppy every waking minute of the day until I get what I want. And it's just such a <laughs> leap in terms of going from lawful good to chaotic evil that there was no in-between. And it just didn't yeah. seem like it's a logical step for that type of character to go. I'm not saying that, you know, maybe she won't look both ways before crossing the street or, you know, she'll jaywalk as a, a risky endeavor for her afternoon. But at the same time, she shouldn't be going to that far extreme either of just being. That or you need to actually like give them that transition to it or give them that push that kind of brings them to it. Because otherwise, it's uh, not so much that this is character development. It's, well, we wrote a story where we need the character to do this. So <laughs> just, we already wrote our C, we have our A, we don't need B, just do A to C. You are literally describing Daenerys looking over oh, the ashes fuck, you of... Told me, yeah, I was just going to say that. <laughs> I was just going to say that. I was like, are you, D are you D.B. Weiss? Um, <laughs> You're on notice, Game of Thrones. Yeah, that's the first Except thing you, you came HBO, to mind, Nick, when you were talking about it. Yeah, HBO's fine. Yeah. They let I the mean, creators their, do their thing, and that's what the creators decided to do there. They HBO wanted this. 10 episodes, I think. They wanted 10 hour long episodes. And anyway. Anyway. They wanted 10 hour long episodes? <laughs> 10? <laughs> One hour season, long. The episode. last season will be 120 hours <laughs> long. <laughs> We'll air it over the course of the next four and a half years. We're going to keep making episodes until George releases the next book. <laughs> <laughs> they did get their uh, comeuppance, though, which I was happy to hear. Oh, they got put on a Star Wars project? I, you, probably, you were probably especially happy to hear that. <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't care, but the fact that they just threw Game of Thrones out the window to work on Star Wars just for Star Wars to turn around and say, you fucked up Game of Thrones, we're not letting you on. <laughs> that is the ultimate icing on the cake. That is like justice served. I mean, it's like screwing over your current job to go to a new one and then the new one calls your previous job as a reference and they're like, oh, sorry, <laughs> bud. <laughs> he didn't quit. Uh, he was fired. He was escorted by police out of the building. Um <laughs> <laughs> it's just so polarizing to know that Game of Thrones was one of the best television shows ever. You couldn't yeah. go anywhere without being bombarded by Game of Thrones stuff and Cultural and you know phenomenon. Westeros and you know, seeing the White Walkers and shit. And now People nobody kids. nobody talks about it. It's taboo to even mention the word Daenerys. Yeah, unless it's a punchline. I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> Bend a knee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Ring, ring. Who this? Ben. Ben who? Ben Denis. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's my number one. Joe, one. don't kill puppies and kids Slayer Johnson. <laughs> He'll win if you yeah. kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Got a big W yeah. waiting for me if you kill me. <laughs> Put one on the board for Puppy Killer Johnson. <laughs> Everything's coming up, Puppy Killer Johnson. <laughs> uh, so that brings me to the grand finale. But I I deceived you. I forgot I had... 12 more. <laughs> well, going back to computers, I just wanted to mention, I guess it's like camcorders slash webcams in movies. I really appreciate it when a production is like, you know what, let's actually use an, a FaceTime camera or a webcam instead of like sitting the $200,000 camera in front of them, slapping a record graphic over it and saying like, <laughs> yep, this is this is their view on their camera. Like Filmed back great... in the early 90s with that <laughs> one kilopixel camera. Getting 120 frames per second in real Wait, time. Are you, are you talking about the... The Game Boy selfie attachment that they had. Yes, the 4K quality. <laughs> yeah, I want, I, I want that level of, uh, of realism. <laughs> it's just like black uh, and green, fifteen pixels. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't you like print those or something? Like they had a I printer. I think so. Or... Yes, <laughs> it came with a Game Boy printer. But yeah, this was an honorable mention. Just like when they use their super high quality camera to stand in as a webcam, I'm like, just use a real webcam. It looks. It's, you don't, I don't know what the hang up is. Just like, it's so much easier. You don't even have to really light it. Just like make it look realistic. Like they want to control. I get wanting to have a look for your movie. You're controlling the lighting. You're doing this. But it's a fucking, everybody knows what webcams look like and they accept the low quality. So just make it real. That's all. You don't have an 8K webcam? (laughs) I could. I have a nice little cinema camera. I can actually make it my webcam. And it's noticeably different. Tape it to the top of your monitor. I'm gonna try. There we go. The whole monitor just tilts down. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't know if there's a reason beyond like, ooh, we can't use a two megapixel camera to for our movie. Like if it's just people are gonna think there's something wrong with their screens (laughs) as they sit watching their movie on their phone. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> somebody's bootlegging it from the movie theater they're just facetiming the movie to them I'm like yeah that's how i see it anyway if anything they're enhancing the quality now with the realism filter enhance this doesn't happen as much anymore but i guess i will i also will say i mean this is like these are tropes that i think most people would think of but the car not starting when you really needed to when it's never had a problem ever in the history of the movie or been hinted upon or just oh, the car doesn't just- start Thank you, Dean. Right I time. just remembered what my other honorable mention was now. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, you don't have to... I mean, mine's... Yeah, everybody knows that trope that the car won't start. I don't really see that hap- happen too much without at least an explanation. Like, this car is janky or broken down or something. But So, Dean, I know I've said it before, but definitely watch Scare Package. If nothing else, just oh, yeah, the that wraparound was your... story. Yeah. Just because they have a whole bit where they're like, doing testing on a slasher the the was it something lake killer and one of the things is they're doing testing of people on like treadmills and it's if he gets within eight feet they trip or there's like any automobile within like 30 yards of him can no longer turn over when placed within 14 meters of any american made car the engine will not start in 17 out of 18 cases (laughs) <laughs> so it's like all of these explanations on why the horror tropes happen i like that that's clever is that stripe is that streaming legally free anywhere or not free it is on, it's I on mean, the the shutter network oh well, i don't have, I'll have to get your login don't tell shutter i will pay for a year of shutter for you dean it's worth it that would be a waste don't do that it, it would be a waste <laughs> it's like when i paid for a year of comiXology to get you into comics and i don't think anybody's logged into that account oh boy Oh boy. Someone's in the hot seat. I'm going to do it. I'm going to read everything in the month. Yeah. So your honorable mention there, Tim, that you remember. So my honorable mention is essentially Chekhov's gun. I 
I don't mind that as a concept. So Chekhov's gun, if there's a, um, I forgot what like play it originally uh, came from, but it was if a gun is presented in Act One, William by Shakespeare's the end of Act 3, gun. the gun has to get used. So it's if you're going to make a point to set up something, it has to be important later. Fine, what, whatever, like great. My issue is when they make it so painfully obvious that it just becomes annoying that it's like, yeah, we get it in the first 10 minutes that it's like, yep, this is how they're going to fix it at the end. It's like, oh, it's, we're at working at the house and oh, well, all of a sudden there was a problem with the electrical and the sun jumps in and he was able to fix it. And they're like, wow, you're a real whiz with wires. You would come in candy in a pinch. Oh, I wonder if he's going to be the one to defuse a bomb at the end of the movie. Like it's it's all of these setups that are painfully yeah. obvious of like, yeah, this will definitely come back later or in the beginning of. <laughs> so actually, I think I was talking to your wife uh, when I was watching it. We are watching The Mutilator, um, also known as Fall Break. Going on up. A fall break. So we were watching it the other night. I enjoy the movie. But at the beginning of the movie, they're going on a road trip and they try to start the car and the car won't start. And they're like, oh, this car. Am I right? Come on. Look at this car's not convinced we're going anywhere. So my philosophy is let's have some beer. <laughs> and then at the end of the movie, <laughs> they try to get away and the car doesn't start. And it's like, yeah, as you know, this man. car doesn't like to start. <laughs> As we know, historically, my vehicle does not like to start. Hopefully this doesn't come back later. So, yeah, that, that annoys me greatly, which kind of leads into a, a second one that deals with that also, um, if you don't have any other thoughts on that. Breaking Bad is one of the greatest shows I have ever watched. And it falls victim to that trope horribly when um, one of the main love interests of the main characters, they pretty much telegraph it from the start that she's going to choke to death on her own vomit. And um, they it's like, oh, what, you'd expect me not to be breathing right now? Or they just hint at it so strongly that um, that's, I think it's, it's one of its few weaknesses that it really stands out that no matter every time she's on scene, it's heavily referenced that, yo, girl, you're going to die in a couple of episodes. <laughs> all, all I could think of is Hot Tub Time Machine with Crispin Glover. Where, uh, his arm. Was in, oh, they in keep waiting day, for it. Where he's, yeah, he's like missing the arm and then they're just waiting. <laughs> like, oh, he's like juggling chainsaws. Oh, like this happens. It's like, oh, this is going to be it. Like that, that's, funny. that's what comes that's to good, mind. That's a good uh, turning it on its head. That's funny. Yeah. But like in in that same vein, the other thing that kind of annoys me is when they'll do something where towards the end of the movie, there'll be like maybe a reveal or it'll be kind of like a callback. But rather than relying or assuming that the viewers are paying attention or the viewers are kind of together enough that they they've also seen the same movie, they know what happened within the past 90 minutes. But then they have to do like a series of flashbacks to the scene where it's like, Oh, all of a sudden the hero pulls out a gun and shoots like at the end of Die Hard. John McClane pulls the gun out from behind his back that he taped there and then shoots him. It's like if they did that, but as before he reaches for the gun, they all do like a flashback of him talking about earlier of like, hey, you have a gun on the plane. It's OK. I always <laughs> carry it. And then they do a second flashback where it's like, I should probably keep this for later. And then he grabs tape and tapes it to him. It's like. I hate when they do a series of flashbacks and it's like, yeah, man, it's only 90 minutes. I'm not a goldfish. I remember what right. happened 40 minutes ago. Yeah. Have some respect for the audience. Like they're going to. No respect. They're going to remember. Yeah. I get no respect. I can't believe it. I'm losing to a rock. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's one I definitely identify with. So I, that's why I, mean, I, I appreciate in movies where they, I know sometimes they end up not doing well or people have criticisms to them because it's like, that was confusing. Yes, sometimes it goes a little too far in the other direction. But English, other times please. I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like other times I appreciate when it's, yeah, we're expecting you to pay attention to this movie. We're expecting you to kind of put two and two together. 
we're not laying all of it out for you. We're not doing a flashback. We're not going to like in the beginning of the movie, telegraph the whole ending to you. Just watch the movie. Yeah. I mean, I get the idea of plant and payoff and it's important and it's a good part of storytelling, but I think it, people, the plant is just front and center a lot of the times. And like, you can see it coming from a mile away. Like, yep. Jimmy can talk to ducks and then cut to the third act. Everybody's tied to a bomb and the only person that can help. <laughs> Everybody's is tied to a duck. Please, Jimmy, <laughs> talk about <him> this. <laughs> Whack. The ducks. The ducks holding the detonator and only Jimmy can, can, can help. Um, yeah. It's... <laughs> I mean, I, I see one. it in terms of things that were effective. Like, okay, Jaws. So during the movie, when they're all on the Orca the canisters end up getting like untethered and they start rolling around and Hooper yells at him and he's like, do you understand what these are? Like, this could be a problem. And it's not painfully obvious of like, wink, wink, nod, nod, this'll come back later. It's more so it works in the scene. It works in the universe of, yeah, this is something that probably would have happened seeing as he's not a seaman. And this probably would have been the explanation of like, this isn't a toy. So then when it comes yeah. back later, it's enough for us to know, oh, okay, yeah, like that makes sense without them having to do a flashback to all of a sudden being like a cloud and <laughs> Hooper being like, these are explosives. I think it worked Everything anyway, because honestly, touches. I don't even remember <laughs> or not so much. I didn't remember. I didn't think of anything of it because I just looked at it more as um, I think that was clever misdirection because I looked at it as just you got loose barrels going around the place like, yeah, they're dangerous and they could knock us over. I didn't think that it was actually going to be used as the weapon. Yeah. Speaking of Jaws, it has one of those (laughs) shots you referenced earlier. Um, When we first get a real look at the shark, I think Brody's leaning over and like just chumming the water and he's turning around and looking and the camera that, you know, shot in a wide, like an anamorphic or widescreen. And it's just this big empty space next to his head of like just there's the water and you're just like it's it's almost like you don't know if it's like an uneasy shot and then that once you realize you think they're going to show the shark and then the shark comes out kind of like with good timing but it, yeah it was like a good example of one of those kind of leading shots where you're like oh shit are they, is something going to come out <laughs> come out which, of the water <laughs> which is in that case like sometimes it's it's fun other times it ends up being so painfully telegraphed. Oh yeah, that, no, yeah, I get it. Like my favorite genre is horror. I love horror movies. But after watching horror movies, it becomes painfully obvious whenever you have somebody that's like goes to do something and then the camera like moves in so there's no coverage on either side of them for the frame and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, it's a tight frame right now because as soon as they go to turn around, there's going to be a jump scare right there. Or like, yeah. oh, they're looking in the mirror to do something. And then they open the, the medicine mi- cabinet to grab, and then they close <laughs> it, and whoa, there it is. I was just going to ask. And then they go one step further baggage. to do the like, okay, well now because it's a cliche, let's turn it on its head. So when they end up doing that, we'll set them up so they're uneasy. But then when they turn, there's nothing there, and I'm waiting for it to come full circle again for people to get so used to that that they're going to go back to the jump scare thing, and that's going to be fresh and original. <laughs> but I yeah. love horror movies. <laughs> Oh shit, I just had another honorable mention. I'll say it quickly. It is uh, like, it was brought up like recently the by guy. or the micro <laughs> Wait, what? guy. <laughs> um, it was brought up recently from watching Camp Cretaceous, but the whole show, I mean movies still do this and it's it's you can see it coming a mile away. The whole show is built around let's we have a problem, let's go out and fix it on the dangerous dinosaur island. We're attacked by a dinosaur. Oh, we're safe. Two seconds. Yeah, there's dinosaur no... barges in. No, you're not safe. It's just that, like, it's Formula. always like, oh, we, oh, we lost them. Boom, they appear. No, you didn't. Here they are. Like, it's every every time. And just that, you can tell that's gonna happen in movies too. Like, they get out of danger, or they think they're okay, and then it's like, nope, they pop in whatever da- the danger was, just is right there still. Jump scare. Oh no. You see, I thought you were going in the direction of each episode follows that same exact structure. It oh, does. it does. Yeah. Oh, because I'm like, saying I'm saying the show is built on that like 
yeah. scare tactic. And it's worse because at no point do you ever feel a sense of peril for the kids because you know they will always live. That's why I feel like first episode, they should just ice one kid. He kind of did. Just like a, a Spinosaurus, just take one of them. Just but two legs still standing there. It wasn't so much like, like none of you are safe. Ice the kid, but the kid fell from a moving monorail, moving pretty fast, like at least like what, maybe 50, 70 feet off the ground and he lived. The fall should have killed him. But when we see him fall from the train, like Bucky Barnes style, we don't see him for, I, I don't remember, maybe at least a couple of episodes. And the kids react like he's dead, but as the viewer, you know, like, he can't be dead, but it's not confirmed yet. But right. you know, deep down, like, right. there's no way in hell they're going to kill any of these kids. <laughs> they get to the end, and then they find the body, and they're like, oh. Oh. <laughs> we weren't but safe I'm... that entire time. <laughs> <laughs> they find his decomposing body. Oh, shit. Um, he's they, now Lord of the I Dinosaurs. Mean... <laughs> <laughs> that show's built like on that. Triceratops. That's actually what really happened. He does really, yeah. An, an it's with an ankylosaur, though, not a triceratops. Camp Cretaceous, hire me. I'll write your next <laughs> season for you. Um, so that show's built on that, but that trope is still prevalent in lots of movies, wherever there's chases or scary elements. Well, one thing I also noticed, so like in not specifically the the people aren't in danger kind of deal, but the each episode following that same structure, I've noticed having more shows on streaming, like access to like, we were, you mentioned Supernatural before, Nick, watching a lot of these shows and going back and then binging them back to back to back, season to season, becomes painfully obvious of all of these ones that were originally planned to be watched like every week, there's a new episode and then they have a break in between seasons. That once you sit down and watch them now, it becomes painfully obvious that it's like, and here's your formula, and this happens, and that happens, and then the season ends. And then the same exact formula with a slightly different, like, reskin happens the next season, and it just keeps going from there. And I don't know if it's just because they were always planned to be week-by-week week kind of deals. They don't expect everybody to really see the full picture all at once, where now they do. Um, which is why I'm surprised with Camp Cretaceous. Because it's specifically made for streaming, so they're assuming people are going to binge it, which is probably where we see the rise of like the the limited series or like the the maxi series, things like that. Now, kind of glad point. to be honest though, because a lot of those episodes, I would be very remorseful to have to wait a week to watch. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> gonna drag this out for me. So my real number one, I mean, it's number one. It's the last one I'm going to mention. <laughs> um. <laughs> Play that TLC song, I think it is. Or no, it's Salt and Peppa. Let's talk about sex. Oh, I was going to say, push it? <laughs> no, uh, it's just, push it. Don't go chasing let's, waterfall? No scrubs? Let's talk about sex. Now you're, yeah, you're crossing TLC. It's Salt and Peppa. Salt and Peppa. Let's talk about sex. This is a two-parter sex. Sex problem I have. Oh, wait, I don't have sex problems. This is a problem <laughs> with sex in movies. <laughs> But it's okay if you have sex problems out there. Don't worry about it. It's normal. Um, anyway. A lot of shoe leather to get through for this one, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think we're virgins here. Not None of us, I don't think. We're all in long-time relationships. Um, so we know how sex goes. We, we Okay, listeners, listen. I have sex, okay? I'm sorry. But sex in particular... Part one, they, there's no better way to say it, dudes just go in, they jam it in dry, what must be dry, because people, they will start making out, and 10 seconds, literally 10 seconds later, the pants are off, and he's, an intercourse has begun. I'm like, no fucking way. Well, Dean, do you really want the foreplay? This is, this is a <laughs> PG movie. Or PG thirteen, depending on the the time of year. Uh, the time this is of... Toy Story, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Sex Toy Story. It really does um, fire on all cylinders. <laughs> but it's like the woman will the woman will cry out in ecstasy and never like pain because dude, you gotta you gotta get it ready. You can't just you can't just get in there, and it just throws me off because I'm like. Either show the sex properly or don't show it in your movie. Just imply that it's happening. Um, I think also uh, there's no there's not proper entirely foreplay. from movies. 
<laughs> well, waste yeah, well, time. Just, if I wanted that, I would just go Google porn. Right. Save me an extra six minutes and let me get back to the action. Six minutes. Actually, have you ever seen the movie Rock and Roller? The uh, the guy Richie film with Gerard Butler. They have a a sex scene with Gerard Butler and I think Thandie Newton that they just do as like a like four second clip where it's just like jumps between four different things, but it's done stylized and it's boom. And then all of a sudden they're smoking and then it just continues on with the story. And it's like, and they got that's through a, the sex scene and got back to the action. <laughs> that's fine. Cause that, that's a, like a specific choice. I feel what like you're they saying just, you want the entire 20, I don't 25 we, minutes. I don't want the entire thing. I'm just like, don't show it. If it's, if you're not going to, if, if it's going to be unrealistic, I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure people would agree it's unrealistic. <laughs> if they're gonna it's have like, it, if they're gonna have it done that quickly, at the very least, they can show the woman disappointed afterward. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, again, it's more so not the time, the length of like the sex itself. It's just like how quickly they get to intercourse from like we're kissing, and then all of a sudden it's like three pumps, and then he's done. No, <laughs> but no, it's, it's no just, transition it's, it's either. It's like in. kiss, There's kiss. No way to say it nice when he enters her. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's no way that's comfortable for either of you and it's just like come on like and you got an erection in five seconds like holy shit the second part of the sex problem (laughs) is there's no there's the dude just rolls over and they like go to sleep i'm like no (laughs) girls gotta go pee you gotta clean up like nope they're gonna maybe if you're wearing a condom i could see this like nobody grabs keeps it on the whole time <laughs> even while soft it stays in place it's like uh what are those like, shrinky dinks they put on eggs wait what <laughs> the uh you know the little plastic things you put on eggs you dip it in the water and then it just like euro seals to the egg no why would you do that you don't it's for like easter eggs Ooh, oh this okay engine. yeah sounds like a sex thing <laughs> I, I mean i feel like that's essentially what would happen <laughs> <laughs> he wakes up the next morning and it's like well can't use this anymore <laughs> it just falls off <laughs> yeah i'm e- either a you're going to bed with the condom on or b you weren't wearing a condom and like you just made a mess everywhere and like nobody's getting out of bed that's just not realistic or he's just being the man and sleeping in the wet spot is, is that what it means it's to be a man? Courtesy. It's well, a I mean, it's a, it's a force her to do it. Chivalry. Chivalrous. Well, clearly <laughs> I mean, we know I Tim does This is putting your coat over a puddle situation. <laughs> I, I mean, mean you live, maybe it is. You're laying on the puddle. <laughs> uh, yeah, sex uh, is chivalry. Just, sex, when they show certain parts of sex in movies, it's just brushed over. It, do the montage. That's fine. That's totally okay. But don't go from kissing and then five seconds later you're thrusting. I'm like, that's nobody's ready for that. Dean Stop wants lying. to see the relationship grow and be uh, fostered <laughs> between. Tim, you're such a parties. romantic. He doesn't want any of that. He just wants to see it go from, you know, all the stages of coitus and then, you know, the final climax. He wants the actual sex scene to be a mini movie within the movie. Oh, like Mant. What? The one I mentioned yeah. from Matinee earlier. Sure. <laughs> exactly it was only so 90 people, minutes ago this is why we need flashbacks we're in a sex positive world now so let's skip the hollywood uh let's skip the the hollywood the hollywooding wood of uh let's skip hollywood scenes. let's skip hollywood independent films only from here on out <laughs> so join us next week for disney's toy story oh wait did i go out of turn <laughs> you you just, number one yeah so we can continue talking about a woody <laughs> 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 Sorry, I stepped on. I that. made another funny. Cut me out. <laughs> <laughs> What's Splinter doing on the roof? Coming. <laughs> this deteriorated a, by the end. To a conclusion. I mean, I have I like how an hour ago we were like, "Wow, we're almost at the end," and it's we're hitting an hour. Nick's already at number one. Now we're creeping at two. We've had, I think, like thirty-six picks. <laughs> Dean has given his Dr. Ruth sex advice. Don't so, go dry, guys. Tim, you might be joining the uh, the fray of cutting complete sections out of the podcast soon. Hell no. <laughs> complete yeah, too, too, too. sections. We'll, we'll see. With Lindoyle. All the news that's fit to print.
Let's um, see if he rises to the occasion. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> that was a pee-pee joke. Never mind. No, I, I get it. I got it. I picked up what you put down. It's a hard act to follow. It is. So, <laughs> did we actually get through our lists? Are we? Yeah. Are we done? There's only done? one I didn't talk about, and I can't think of any examples. It was mentioned to me over that podcast I I did because they mentioned a trope. I'm like, oh, that's a good one. And I completely forgot the context. When superheroes forget about their own powers, <laughs> like and it happens. It, it's just strength. Like one that comes to mind is like Wolverine is um in, it's established in the X-Men movie continuity that he has an enhanced sense of smell, but he can't tell the difference between Jean Grey and M- Mystique when she is pretending to be the mm. other one. Oh, you mean like conveniently like they should they sh- yeah, I got I see what yeah. you're saying. They should know how to do this, but they just don't. Yeah. Like, in the comics, they have Wolverine being able to tell, like, somebody had a burrito four days ago or something like that, but he can't tell the difference between, like, the love of his life. (laughs) Comics, I kind (laughs) of let slide, because there was a lot of examples in comics, but that just boils down to, like, who's writing the story. True. And Plus, it's such a longer timeline of things that it's like, yeah, at some point, there's going to be inconsistencies. Sure. But in movies directly, I mean, it's just how do you forget that you can do, you know, your main ability. And it's why some actors, or not actors, but some characters get knocked out really early in the movie because their power is just too much that they would just kind of win the day easily. Like, imagine if Magneto was in the MCU during Age of Ultron, it would be over in a heartbeat. (laughs) Which kind of goes into another one that um, I was talking about the other day is whenever a, a villain ends up becoming a hero or like joining the heroes or like whenever we have a, a hero who traditionally was super powerful, supposedly, and they make a big deal out of it, it's like their power fluctuates depending on if they need it for the story or not. It's, oh, Superman can do all this by himself until we kind of need a reason for the Justice League. And then it's, oh, he needs help. Or, oh, uh, I don't know. I think I was talking the other day about Jason Statham being the villain, holding off everyone in the movie in Fast and the Furious. And then as soon as he switches sides, it's like, nope, now he's just one of the group doing his thing. It's like playing against the boss in a fighting game versus actually playing the boss exactly. character. Exactly. Yeah. Power creep. Dean, you said your wife had a list? Oh, I, I, I was using her examples as proxy. Oh. You, you said the, in English, please, that was literally one of hers. And then the cigarette one. Uh, was not good finishing one. the cigarette. And then taking your eyes off the road constantly while driving. Yeah, that drives me fucking crazy. I hate seeing that. I'll call them out on it, too. I'll yell at the screen. Eyes on the fucking road, buddy. (laughs) Just once, I want them to look (laughs) dead at the screen and be like, oh, (laughs) sorry. Then I was watching Fast and the Furious 2, and there's an entire segment where he keeps his eyes off the road, and he's just driving with uh, his eyes locked on Evan Mendez. Like, oh, you're, you're pushing it, man. But at least he, like Tyrese, yells at him for that one. Like, hey, man, I taught you that trick. That's not a fucking thing to be proud of, dude. That's not something to be proud. So do we have any other honorable mentions that haven't been honorably mentioned? Or in this case, I suppose dishonorably mentioned. Um, Probably, but not th- we can think of. We'll get back to it in Tired Tropes 2. The search for return more of the gang. I don't know. So, okay, gang, that wraps up another episode of Rule of Thirds. And we'd like to thank you for coming along for the ride and discussing our biggest trope pet peeves. As you know, you can reach us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Screen Refresh. Those are all social media platforms. Or, as you know, you can shoot us an email to ScreenRefresh at gmail.com. That's an email server. Let us know what your top three are or if you have any topics you want to hear us discuss. As always, this is Tim, one of the hosts, for Nick and Dean, two of the other hosts. Have a great week and catch us on Screen Refresh, our other podcast, the first Monday of the month. Hello there, again.